All right, we are live. Hello all, and thank you for joining us for this very special console deep dive. We appreciate you taking time out of your week, wherever you're at, whatever time it's at, for during this Microsoft Ignite 2021 virtual conference. My name is Jono, I'm a developer advocate with HashiCorp, and I'm joined by console education engineer, Derek Strickland, and my cohort DA from the Netherlands, Eric Feld. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to interact with us in chat. Uh, as you do, please keep in mind our code of conduct in this virtual space. In general, we strive to be welcoming, inclusive, friendly, and patient. We ask that you be considerate and respectful, and above all, be professional. If you have any questions about our code of conduct, you can check it out at hashicorp.com slash community guidelines. We'll see you a little later in the show, Eric. Until then, let's go ahead and get started. So Derek, I see that HashiCorp has this really awesome microservices collection that was just released. And with so many people playing buzzword bingo, can you kind of shed some light on what it means by a microservice when we talk about moving to microservices with minimal maintenance? Yeah, sure. So microservices, there, there's no canonical definition, of course, but some, some basic characteristics that we think of when we are talking about microservices are a, a focused set of functionality that can be deployed more or less independently. They'll communicate with other services through contracts. And so you do have to coordinate your contracts through uh, deployment. But in general, it should be independently deployable, uh, independently testable, um, and focused on a very small section of your uh, business logic or business domain. Um, so these tools and paradigms have developed uh, as did, you know, the distributed systems approach to solving problems. Uh, hit the market. Uh, previously, we used to do things in what we would call a monolith, where all the code was sort of embedded in one binary, deployed together, and then just spoke through different um, software library layers. Uh, we just took those layers, and we split them up, and we put them out uh, into different running instances. Awesome. So with the, this microservice pattern, they generally tend to be facilitated uh, through another technology and paradigm, which we're going to touch on very briefly, which is service mesh. But before we dive into that, I'd like to tell you all a little story. We're going to be diving into a fictional world where we're taking on a monolith called HashiCups. We're a dev team that's been enabled to make the most profitable service that, that our company has and revitalize it for this new age. If this sounds familiar or you've read the Phoenix Project, let me know. In being tasked to decompose this monolith, we need to go through and kind of address some of the challenges. We're gonna take a look at that decomposition and in depth, talk about how we can leverage managed services to make a process like this easier, and then iterate on our code to see what those next steps look like. So without further ado, Derek, would you mind walking us through what we're looking at for this monolith? Yeah, so what we've got here uh, in the, in the HashCups application, um, is uh, a, a situation where a, a lot of our business domain is, is isolated in one unit, or not isolated, rather like glommed together in one uh, dis deployed distributed uh, binary. In this case, it's our REST API. And right now our REST API is taking care of all the business logic related to um, searching products, logging in, logging out, auth Z, auth N, and then our ordering and payments, okay? And so what we're seeing here is you, if you look at this diagram, this little uh, sequence diagram, you can see that clients make calls to the REST API uh, and they hit the coffees route and that, that will hit the products uh, uh, component within the monolith, which then calls some database tables in the Postgres database. They hit another route and it handles authorization. They hit another route and it handles ordering. Well, all those route handlers are glommed into one REST API. Uh, and that makes it hard to do deployments for different teams that handle ordering versus authorization versus uh, searching. And so what we what the team needs and wants to do is sort of split this up so that they can uh, move iterate more quickly as independent operating units. Uh, and so that's what we're gonna we're gonna walk through the process. Uh, you know, looking at these three layers, uh, we'll talk a little bit later about which one we're going to extract first and why, but that's the general overview of the monolith. And with this monolith, we're going to be decomposing it a bit. So we're going to be looking at the HashiCorp console service on Azure. Uh, Derek, what's the service mesh and kind of talk me through how it's going to enable us with this monolith or this older style application architecture. Yeah. So the service mesh is a, um, 
it's like an, a, an aspect of managing your application, right? Uh, it's the networking aspect. And what we need to be able to do is allow secure communications between different, lay, uh, different uh, coordinating services uh, securely um, in a cloud or multi-cloud environment, right? And so what the service mesh does for us is it, it, it ensures that all our communications take place over MTLS. It makes sure that all our communications are secured with ACLs. Um, and then it handles a lot of the com complexities related to um, establishing connections, secure connections between different cloud providers uh, or different regions within the same cloud provider, et cetera. Uh, and what it allows us to do is instead of getting deeply into the weeds of configuring individual uh, cloud provider networking components, we can just sort of at a high level at the service mesh level, configure rules and policies uh, that will get applied to the mesh itself using pretty straightforward configuration languages like uh, YAML and HCL and uh, just have those policies applied to the service mesh uh, so that things get routed uh, at, at like we want or secured uh, with the constraints that we want to apply. Um, Service mesh consists of a control plane and a data plane. The control plane is the brains of the operation that says, hey, this is what is allowed. This is what our policies are. These are all the registered services. This is where they exist. And then the data plane receives that state and then is, resides closer to each service so that when a service makes a request, it can just look at that replicated state and get routed right away to where it needs to go uh, within the mesh. Awesome. So for this particular instance, we're talking about console, which is this control plane that has servers and then client agents that go through and facilitate this. One of the things that as console has grown, its functionality has been expanded multiple times. For this particular set, we're going to be looking at console as a managed service. With this, one of the things that people point to for managed services is the lower barrier to entry for going through and playing with these tools. Can you talk a little bit more about the managed service benefits of Azure? Yeah, for sure. Um, so that's, you know, that's the, the, the key takeaway, right? Like the, you've got this control plane and this data plane and the control plane can be relatively complicated to, to run. Um, and so by using our HCS managed service, you, you just offload that all to, right? You just, you hand that task over to our site reliability engineers you configure it through the HCS, or I'm sorry, the Azure Marketplace, um, and and you're off to the races. And now it just sort of reduces the footprint of console-related concerns that you have to be taking into your development process or your release process. Right now, you've just got to think about the client agents and then configuring your services themselves so that they interact with the control uh, with with the service mesh uh, in the way that you want them to. And so a huge part of that operational burden is just sort of lifted away. Another added benefit of buying it through the, the marketplace is that, uh, you know, procurement, um, you might have, it might be a difficult process for you to get budget for a new purchase, but you might have a general Azure bucket for the year. And so being able to procure it through the marketplace just, you know, streamlines, streamlines that for your organization. And when we talk about some of the paradigms and different hats that roles wear, um, for historically large applications, you may still be in a position where you are a dev team only and you don't have access to infrastructure or alternatively, your infrastructure team may already be overwhelmed with the resources that they're supporting today. So with this, this enables developer teams to focus on changing their develop their application architecture within their development cycles and also offloads the burden on the operation teams who have historically needed to make, run and maintain console. So with that, we've talked a little bit about the story so far. We're going to go through and give a little bit of context as to the process that we're going to be going through here. Now, without doing any sort of hand wavy magic, let's talk a little bit about what we went through and did. Uh, Derek will be able to show this in more length, but we went through and used Terraform for as much of our provisioning as possible, also kind of mimicking a conventional ops team where we use the Azure provider to control our Azure resources, the new HCS provider to help make setting up HCS easy, repeatable, and consistent with infrastructure as code patterns, and then also the Terraform Helm provider to deploy the console clusters or clients to the AKS clusters and manage our applications with. 
Um, we're going to show different sets of tools throughout all of this, but we wanted to give you a context of where we're starting from. And with that, let's go through and talk about this monolith. So we talked about the actual portion of all the different components. Derek, can you walk us through how a dev team would identify a discrete set of functionality? Sure, so in this particular situation, uh, what the team did was uh, sort of, uh, we're gonna talk about it as, as if it were a case study that happened, and, and right? As uh, in, in a weird way it was when, when we built this sample app. Um, when you look at your monolith, uh, you probably want to try to come out of the gate with a quick win, with an, an uncomplicated use case, uh, so that you can just sort of get, you know, if it's your first foray into microservices, there's a lot of moving parts, and you really want to try to maximize your, your chances of winning by reducing complexity and reducing impact. And so when the team looked at these different layers, they kind of realized that, okay, there's a dependency between the ordering layer and the authorization layer, because you have to be logged in in order to make an order. Um, there's a pseudo dependency between the ordering layer and the products layer because you need a product, a valid product ID to make an order, but it's really just a data dependency. It's not a hard code dependency. Um, and, and then the searching for products or copies in this case, there was no real dependency there at all. You, did, you don't need to be behind the login. You don't need to interact with, you know, you feed data to the ordering layer, but you don't consume data from the ordering layer. And so it just sort of made sense that, you know, this, and all it does in general is a query, right? There's no command side to that, uh, to, to that layer. So it just made sense for the team to split the, the products off to begin with um, and copies specifically. They focused very, you know, we decided in this, uh, this demo app to focus on just the copy data, no product data, uh, you know, no merch data, nothing like that, uh, just copies. And so that's what we did. So if we, so to make this, yeah, there you go, thank you. Um, so what we did is we just kind of updated this slide to take those other layers out of view and kind of zoom in on what we're gonna focus on on this demo. Um, next slide. Uh, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna extract a microservice for, that co for just the coffees route. If you notice on that slide previously, you saw forward slash coffees. That's a route that you're probably familiar with, right? It just looks like a route to a service. Uh, uh, it's a handler. So uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna configure a service at the service mesh layer, then we're gonna publish deployment, and then we're gonna reroute traffic to that service based on that route, okay? And so this first slide here just shows you, a, this is a, a CRD, a custom resource definition. Uh, we're gonna set up a service default value for our coffee service. What is that? What is that? Well, we're gonna basically say that to the service mesh, hey, this service uses the HTTP protocol, we need to use the HTTP protocol in order to, uh, so that console can affect it at layer seven. So we're gonna need to register that and we'll show you that when we get into the code in, in the demo. And then in the next step, uh, we're just doing a quick overview. Uh, we're gonna apply some, some annotations to uh, our service definition itself as we deploy it. So we can tell it, uh, we, can, we can decorate it with metadata that, that uh, console needs in order to be able to manage the service, register it with the catalog, et cetera. And then finally, we're going to add another custom resource definition, layer seven for the, uh, called a service router. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna tell the service mesh layer, hey, um, I'm, I want to apply this rule to the product API service. Whenever something comes in that matches this prefix or this route forward slash coffees, we're gonna reroute it to this destination service called coffee service, okay? And so those configs right there lead us into this next diagram, which is just a, um, a visual of what would happen once we do that. So step one, we apply the service and, the, and then we deploy the service. The service mesh will look like this. And then when we apply steps, so that's steps one and two, when we apply step three, uh, the service mesh will update to look like this so that when clients call in, they're gonna hit that router at the service mesh layer first. The router is gonna examine the path prefix and route the uh, request accordingly. If it's for some other product type, it'll just continue to go to the monolith. If it hits the forward slash coffees route or path prefix, it will get uh, it will bypass the monolith and go directly to the coffee service, which can talk to the Postgres database. And so there you go. That's what it'll look like when our microservices. So that's all the slides. You want to get into the demo? Yeah, let's go for it. All right, great. I think I'm going to take over screen share now.
Give me just a moment. All right, so you should all be seeing a four panel uh, console. Let me know when you can. Yep, you're all good. Great, okay, so in the top two panels, what we're gonna do is we're gonna watch traffic flowing through the mesh. I'm, I've loaded up a, a program called K9s, which is Kubernetes monitoring uh, administration uh, extension. Um, and what we're gonna do, I've used, you'll notice I've got this product API, which is the monolith that we're trying to, to strangle in this, in this demo. Um, I'm gonna hit the L key after selecting it, and it'll show logs for that, uh, for that, that pod inside the service mesh. Um, I haven't yet deployed my uh, coffee service, so I'm gonna walk us through the steps of doing that. Um, so right now, uh, we are going to do a quick review of the console UI, what we've got set up. We've got some services deployed. We've got a front end service that talks to a, an API gateway called public API, and we've defined an intention uh, at, this, at the console layer. If you're not familiar with intentions, they're a very, very uh, low barrier to entry way of managing traffic throughout the service mesh. An intention console on HCS is secure by default, which means that everything has a deny all policy. And so you'll have to, you'll have to uh, define explicit uh, intentions between services that are allowed to speak to each other. So we've done that in advance. Uh, and we've got a front end service, which is our static web UI. And it talks to this, this gate, uh, API gateway that we've named public API. That public API in turn calls multiple different backend APIs, one of which is this REST monolith that we're going to strangle. And then that, uh, that public API can talk to the REST monolith and then the REST mon monolith can talk to the database service that's all running on. So let's go take a look at our um, code for a second. We've got a, so this is what our, our source code looks like. We've got um, some console configuration files. We've got some folder named dev team. Uh, that contains the application assets that the dev team might deploy. And we've got an infrastructure folder uh, that the infrastructure team would maintain with all the Terraform that Jono mentioned before. We've got our resource groups, our data center configuration. Uh, we've also got our uh, VNet peering configuration, et cetera. So we're just going to go ahead and collapse that infrastructure and then focus up here into what the dev team would be for uh, collaborating with the, uh, the infrastructure team. One so of the one things I would also... Oh, sorry, Derek, just to jump in real quick. One of the things I wanted to point out is in this particular demo, we've decided to store all of the different layers as folders. If your team is more distributed or has different requirements, each of these could effectively be their own independently running repositories that affect different layers of your infrastructure or stack based off of what your silo may need as well too. Um, just wanted to chime in why some of those organization aspects are there. Uh, if you're curious to find out more, please check out our recently published Monolith versus uh, multi-repo blog by Tracy. It's a very good discussion on trying to find what works for your team structure. Great, thanks, thanks. Um, so I wanna jump into a couple of quick things I wanna point out to you. Um, so a couple of... Uh, we've got a traffic job that we've defined here. Um, and what this is gonna do is just simulate some traffic through, through the, uh, the service mesh so we can watch it um, and in real time and, um, and see the, the effects of our, our configuration on the service mesh. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and I'm going to spin that up and it's in this directory, great. So I'm gonna do, I've got a, uh, I use OMYZSH and I've got an extension for Kubernetes or a plugin that allows me to just use K uh, to, to alias kube control. So I'm just going to use kube control, apply traffic. And once that starts running, it'll spend, take a couple of minutes to spin up, but then we should start to see um, once it's live that uh, traffic to the, um, the logs over here in the product API will start to uh, increment. Um, and uh, just to give you a quick heads up of what this all looks like, we're going to take a quick look at the, the, the sample application, they are looking at the front end in our browser. We'll do a quick forward 
Um, and we'll take a look at the application in the browser. And this is our web UI. And the fact that it loaded there shows that, okay, we went all the way through all the layers uh, and got data back from the database. Uh, and here you go, you can see this little quick, um, this log entry that got created by that manual uh, um, uh, navigation that I did in the browser, but we're not seeing any, any, anything from our traffic. Why is that? Well, it's because we haven't registered in an attention yet. So the, the, um, the traffic from the traffic simulator can't actually talk to the front end. So we have to create an intention to allow that to happen. So we'll say that the traffic uh, service can talk to the front end service. And we're gonna leave this set to allow. And then we hit save. Uh, okay, that's, that's set up. And if we go back over here, look at that. All of our logs are getting updated over here. So great, the service mesh is doing what it's supposed to do. And look how easy it was to do that, right? To secure that traffic. Uh, and so we got some validation that that's working. Um, so now that we have that though, uh, we wanna illustrate this whole idea of strangling the monolith and rerouting some, uh, some data or request rather traffic from the product API over to our coffee service. And to do that, we're gonna do, we're gonna do a few things. Uh, we are going to, uh, we're gonna configure a service for the coffee service at, this, uh, at the Kubernetes and console layer. So we're gonna to need to register a Kubernetes service that looks like this. We're gonna set up a service account that goes with that. And then we're gonna define these service defaults, which is again, an L7 uh, CRD for the console uh, layer. And we're gonna say that the, again, the protocol is HTTP like we discussed back on the slide deck. So we'll do that over here. In this folder, we've got some assets for the dev team, right? And so, We'll uh, apply this service configuration. And then we're gonna go ahead and deploy the services itself as well. And uh, what was it, V3? We're gonna deploy the, the coffee service that, the, and we can see up here that it got uh, registered at the Kubernetes layer. And um, it's currently spinning up. And once it's ready, we'll start watching its logs. One of the things that I'd like to point out as well, too, is we're running V3. This could be version whatever, but this is an illustration of how decoupling your application team from the infrastructure requirements and really enabling them to do the development they need to can be facilitated by these multiple versions and iterations, even if our infrastructure hasn't changed in between those. Yeah, great point. Um, and so now we've, we've created um, that coffee service, we all, but, and it needs to, so the front end needs to be able to talk to the coffee service and the coffee service needs to be able to talk to the Postgres database, right? Because in essence, it's just like the product ABI, API in terms of its, its uh, service mesh footprint because uh, it's taking over a portion of that uh, uh, traffic flow. So we're gonna create a, another intention from the front end I'm sorry, from the public API to the coffee service. And we're gonna save that. And we're gonna create yet another intention from the coffee service itself to the Postgres database. We're gonna save that. Okay, so now traffic should be able to flow through the mesh effectively. John, keep me, you've got the crib sheet there with all our required intentions, keep me honest. Um, and, uh, but still, you know, we haven't rerouted anything. So to reroute our, in, um, our infrastructure, we were gonna wanna look at this service router file that I referenced in the, um, in the, uh, the uh, slide deck. And so we'll take a quick gander at that. And it's really straightforward. Again, it's just gonna say, hey, whenever any traffic hits the service mesh uh, for the product API that as this path prefix, reroute it to that destination server, okay? And so we're just gonna, you know, it's a, since it's a CRD, we can just Q control apply it again, and we'll do the service router. And it, oh, look at that. The traffic failed over that quickly from the, um, from the product API to the coffee service. I mean, it was near, nearly instantaneous. 
and we've begun the process of strangling our monolith. Um, and that's just, that's just one of the simple, we could have done this with canary deployment. There's, there's a lot of features at the service metro layer that we didn't show here. This is just a very basic you know, uh, example. And I think some of those advanced uh, and, and, and other L7 options are gonna be illustrated by Eric and I don't wanna bite into his time. So I'll stop there and say, Jono, um, are we good to move on? So far, we're good. So just to kind of wrap up the story for what we've started, uh, Derek, as a one-man wrecking ball team, has gone through and tore apart our monolith. We have a great microservice that's uh, able to run, and we've seen how using console and the uh, Layer 7 intentions and CRDs for Kubernetes allow us to spin off these services and really demonstrate how we can move towards microservice architecture. Now, whether or not microservices are right for you and your team is something that you need to talk about with your product managers and uh, directors and leads. But we hope that we've illustrated in this particular example how removing the barrier of infrastructure in some instances and enabling a use through a managed service means that developers can focus spending their time on developing applications, on figuring out how they want this more dynamic way of applications to be deployed and used throughout uh, their infrastructure. And we really look forward to seeing just the ways that this will expand and grow. Now, with that, it seems like questions are quiet. So friendly reminder, please feel free to drop questions in the chat. Uh, we will be feeding them uh, through to the speakers and picking them up at the tail end. So this is really great for Linux workloads on the Azure cloud, but what about our systems that are stuck in a Windows world? How do we go through and interact with the service mesh through that? Eric? Well, I'm, I'm glad you asked, Jono, because <laughs> that's actually what I'm going to be talking about. I, I'm going to be talking about something I'm myself very excited about because for a really long time, all, all of this Envoy sidecar proxy beauty was just limited to Linux work, workloads. Um, and now thanks to hard work of, of mostly Microsoft, we now have an alpha version of the Envoy proxy on Windows. Um, and I'm going to show off how we can use that to kind of do some of the things that Derek was, was showing um, but just natively on Windows without touching any, any Linux. Um, so let me share my screen and hop right in. There we go. I hope that's legible. Let me uh, wrap this one. So to start off, um, if you wanna try and do this at home, um, first a disclaimer, this is all still alpha um, and there's still some manual things that we need to, to do. Um, but once all of this goes um, GA, I'm, I'm sure it'll all work as, as flawlessly as, as Derek showed. So the, the first step is to actually get the Envoy binary. And that, that is quite a step, unfortunately. So um, the way Envoy likes to distribute its binaries is through Docker images. And in this case, we need a Windows Docker image. Um, and those are fairly large. So I've actually created this little script that'll automatically download the image um, and then extract the Envoy binary from it. So basically what we're doing is we're creating a uh, derivative image from the Envoy dev uh, binary for, for Windows. And then I'm copying out the Envoy binary from the path where it is in the container and then just putting it in the local directory and then removing that temporary container, right? So that gives us the Envoy binary. Now, if you wanna follow along later, we'll, we're gonna put this all in a demo repository so you can follow along yourself. And we've actually put the binaries that you need there in that repository as it releases. Um, and as part of running this, um, this environment, it'll automatically download those for you and, and start them up, right? Um, that's also to make sure that all the versions that we are running here <laughs> will be the versions that you will then be running just to make sure that there's no incompatibilities there going along the way since everything is still um, development, right? So 
Um, in this case, we're, we're downloading the console binary for Windows. Um, so we, we could have gotten that one from the HashiCorp website, but just to make sure that the versions all match, we, we grab that from the GitHub releases there. Um, and then we, we've put the Envoy binary that I downloaded with that script there. And then the third application that we're downloading is fake service, um, which is kind of like an application that, that Derek showed that is for fake traffic and connecting uh, fake services to, together and acting like a real service, right? So with those binaries downloaded here locally, we can now actually get started, right? So in this setup, um, we're going to do a few things, right? So the initial thing is download those binaries, right? And put them in the binaries folder, as I just said. So that'll happen automatically when I'll, I'll run this blueprint. And then we need to set up the console server. Now, I'm going to just be using a single console agent as both the server and the client. But this would work however you want to run console. You can run your console servers on Linux and have your agents join from Windows. That'll work perfectly. We're, we're going to be adding a demo to it later as well, where we'll hook up Windows agents to a Kubernetes cluster as well. So in order to run that console server, we'll need to generate some configuration. Um, and that configuration is fairly simple. Uh, here we go. Ooh, where is it? Config templates, there we go. So all of this is, is fairly standard. We want to enable the server. Um, since I'm just running a single node, it'll just be bootstrap expect one. Um, and basically, the only things that are important in this case are here at the bottom. Right? I want to enable connect, which will enable the service mesh capabilities. And I want to enable the gRPC port, because that is what Envoy will talk to to get service discovery information and also to talk to when doing things like uh, checking intentions. So other than that, I'm passing in um, a variable in this template to set the data directory so it's in a local directory and the application actually has the rights to write to it. Right. So that gives us our config. And then all we're going to do is we're going to execute the console binary, right? So I'm going to execute the binary that we have here locally in the uh, binaries folder. And I'm going to run it as agent and then pass in that config directory that we specified um, above, right? Because that is where the config will be written to. So we're just going to use the same directory down here. Um, and I want to keep running this in the background. Now, if you're unfamiliar with this syntax and are wondering what this is, to run this demo, I'm using a, a small tool called uh, Shipyard, which will spin up the local dev environment for us, um, which allows us to quickly spin it up. And once we're done, get rid of everything um, so it's nice and clean again, right? No binaries hanging around, et cetera. So after that, we should have a console service uh, server, but we still need our applications. Uh, kind of similar like Derek, I'm going to have a front end that will be talking to a back end. Um, and instead of splitting out a, a microservice from a monolith, I'll just have two versions of the back end application where I can first test out the, the new service and eventually migrate over. So that's what these two services are. So I have my uh, backend service. Now, let me first scroll the way, all the way down to the actual service itself, right? It is just going to execute the fake service binary. Um, and fake service is a little application that my colleague Nicholas Jackson wrote. And the nice thing about fake service is you can configure it entirely through environment variables. So if we want to change the upstreams that get called or Maybe we want to simulate some errors. We can tell it to, OK, maybe error out 50% of the time. And then that way, we can actually showcase like error scenarios, et cetera. So we're going to be running that. Um, it's going to be listening on port 9990. And it'll 
tell us a message, hello from V1, right? Then in front of that, we're going to be having the front end application, right? Which again is just a fake service, um, listening on a different, ooh, don't want to do that, listening on a different port. And it has an upstream URI that points at the backend, right? Now you might be wondering why is this port different? Because we specified 9,999 9, and one, I think, or zero. Uh, version two will be pointing at one. That's because we're actually pointing at the sidecar um, and, and a, a port on that sidecar service instead, right? So the sidecar, we will be spinning up ourselves, right? Which is the Envoy binary that we downloaded. But in order for Envoy to configure itself, we need a bootstrap file. Right? And this is normally something that console will do for you. It'll generate the whole bootstrap file and then start the Envoy proxy. But because um, Envoy isn't out yet, that compatibility isn't entirely there yet. So what you would normally do is if you would run this command, so console connect Envoy and then sidecar for whichever service you, you want a sidecar for. Um, and if you run it with the dash bootstrap, you actually get an output of the bootstrap config that you would get. And the thing that you would receive in that case uh, is something like this. So it's a, a big JSON file and overall it's fine. The only um, incompatibility right now is that by default, the access lock path, if you if it's not being configured, would go to slash dev slash null, which obviously on Windows is not a file path that, that would work. Um, so that's why we actually grab a template of one of those bootstraps that is that is generated by console, and we're just populating it our, ourselves, right? So in this case, I have the, the file and I'm passing in some variables so we don't get port clashes. So each of the sidecar proxies will listen on a different port. And I'm passing in the name of the service and the ID of the service. So they all uh, connected to different services. The rest is all generic for, for all of them. Um, and so there's, there's not a lot of differences there. So in order to generate that bootstrap that we use here, we again use that template and we populate some of those variables, right? So we're going to populate the service name, set it to backend. We want a unique ID for each of the instances uh, so we can actually route to different ones. And then to prevent port clashes, I'm going to use a different admin port for backend one and backend two. So that'll get generated and then used by Envoy. So let's just spin this up and while that spins up, I'll talk through kind of the setup that we're going to get. So we're gonna do a shipyard run and then I'm passing it the folder of my blueprint, which in this case, everything is located in, in this folder. And then we'll just give it a second. Um, if we didn't have those binaries yet, it would actually download it for us um, and, and then start them up. Um, and what it's also doing is it's spinning up a docs container. Uh, right now, this is still somewhat bare bones, but we're going to flesh that out and release that later. So you can actually follow along with all of these steps um, yourself and go through it. So let's just refresh. And we can see that we have console is up and running we have our front end application and we have two instances of the back end right and we can see that the front end is correctly configured to talk to the back end so that all looks okay there's one instance of the the front end so everything seems correct right if we go to the back end we see we have both instances so that seems to work well if we take a look at fake service we can see 
that it seems to be routing perfectly. So no issues there. Um, and to just illustrate the difference between the uh, two backends, because right now, since we have nothing else configured, it'll round robin between the two instances that it can find since they're both called backend. There we go. We can see we have a hello from V1, a hello from V2 down here. And if we keep doing that, it'll keep uh, splitting between those two, right? Just round robin using DNS. So what we have actually created, and I was gonna do that in the meantime, but it was a bit too quick, <laughs> is somewhat like this, right? Where app A is our front end, which is talking to the sidecar proxy that gets populated with service discovery information from console. And that proxy will talk to the proxy of the backend, which then forwards the traffic to the application, in this case, backend, right? Um, in, in our case, right now, there are actually two of these blocks, and it's round robining between those two, right? OK. So now that we have that all running, how can we actually use this on Windows to do some cool things just like Derek showed, all right? So let me open up my editor again. Now, Derek was using CRDs to configure the service mesh. I'm just going to be, oh, it is a Windows desktop. Nick, don't, don't worry, let's here. There we go, it's, it's really Windows. Um, so instead of using CRDs, we're going to be using the HCL format for that same configuration. Um, if, if you afterwards take a look again at, at Derek's configuration, it's pretty much the same um, hierarchy of information. It's just HCL instead of YAML. So before we can use any of the L7 features, uh, just like Derek did by setting the protocol, we need to do that. So we want to write a service defaults for the backend service and set it to HTTP to be able to use that. And then I want to create two subsets for each of my backends, right? Now, if we go back to the config, the reason why console actually could pick up those services automatically is because in the server config directory, we have service files already, right? And these files basically configure the console services. So in this case, we have the front end service uh, with its ID listening on port 9090. And then here we have the sidecar configuration. So um, just as we um, defined in the fake service, it wants to talk to the upstream on localhost 1991. This is actually where that port 1991 comes from, right? So we're just telling it, we want to talk to backend. We don't really care where it is. Um, we're just gonna listen on localhost and any traffic going to 1991 should be routed to backend, right? Or yes. <laughs> And then in the backend services, um, it's fairly similar, only we don't have any upstreams, so we're not gonna be configuring those, right? So we can just leave that empty. We just wanna specify that we do want a sidecar service. Now, an important thing in this service stanza is that we have defined a metadata block. And the reason why this is very important is we're going to be using this metadata to be defining our two subsets of backend. So we're gonna be uh, switching between V1 and V2 here, right? So if we take a look at the UI and we go to one of these, we can actually see that metadata here picked up by console. And for the other one, no, wrong one, backend. There we go. Uh, that, that was V1. I think I did V1 before as well. So just to show no smoke and mirrors, we have V2 here. Now that is the field that we will be using in our 
resolver. So we're creating a resolver for the backend. Um, I'll skip over this for a second. Um, and we are creating two subsets. So we're creating a subset that we've named V1, but we could call this green and the other one blue, or um, we can call one live and the other one canary. Um, it, it's free to use anything you want. And we're specifying a filter. And in this case, we're specifying a filter that looks at the meta field of version. And if it's V1, you're going to be in the V1 subset. If the version is V2, you're going to be the V2 subset. subset. And now that we have those two subsets, we want to specify which one is the default to go to. Because otherwise, it'll just keep round robining. Um, and in, in our case, in the next scenario, that's not what we want. So we're going to set the default subset to V1. So all the traffic should keep going to V1 by default. But we have that new version. And me as a developer, I would like to test that version. I would like to throw it into the, the test environment. Or maybe I feel brave and I want to throw it into the production environment, like be a wrecking ball like Derek. So I'm going to deploy it there. And I'm just going to specify in service mesh configuration that if I specify a header of x group equals dev, I want to be sent to my new version, right? And the way we do that is just like Derek showed, we're going to make a service router for the backend. But instead of routing on path, right, we're going to route on header, right? So if you wanted to, you could add additional matches here where you're saying like, oh, if it's the header of this, I want to go there. If it's a path, go there, right? You can make these as complicated as you want. Um, in this case, we're going to keep it fairly simple. But any of these blocks can be combined to route to one of the backends, right? So we can configure a service router. We can do a splitting, which we'll do later on. And then we can use the resolver to route to a certain subset, right? And eventually, that can lead into something like this, where it's like, OK, try this uh, a few times. Um, and then if we correctly get uh, a result, one of the backends is live, then do a split of 10% versus 90%. and uh, inside there, if it's this path, go to there. You can you can make it as complex as you want. We're going to keep it simple for today. So if the header has X group dev, I want to go to the destination of V2, which is the subset we specified before. So let's set that up, right? Let's switch back to Windows. So let's do console config write, and then I need to check what the path was again. Oh, config. Okay. So config, and then we want to do the backend defaults first, because remember, we need to set uh, the protocol to HTTP. So we can do L7 features. We want to specify the resolver. And then we want to add that router. Now, the cool thing is, in the UI, we can actually check how all that links together, right? We can now see that, OK, anything going to slash by default would go to v1. But if we have a prefix of slash and it has a header of x group that matches dev, go to v2, right? So that should mean that if I keep doing this, don't mind that first error that was just caching. I blame that on Nick. He's in the chat if you want to blame him. Um, but to illustrate it a bit more clearly, if I do it on the command line, we'll get the output with the body. So if I don't specify a header, I always end up at v1. But if I specify my header, we can now see that I'm going to my v2. So if we have some authentication method or something in there that, that we can securely prove that, oh, I'm part of this group or, or whatever, we can now have that group test the features before they are live. 
make sure that everything's working uh, with all the other related services. Because you know, with microservices, there's a lot of dependencies. And this way, we can actually test those dependencies where it matters most. So that's cool. I, I now know it's working, right? Now I slowly want to migrate from V1 to V2. Now, this is where the really cool stuff happens, right? We're going to add a traffic splitter, and we're going to be reusing those subsets that we defined before, but we're going to be splitting between them, right? And I'm going to go all cannonball and, and immediately go 50-50, um, just so it's a bit more clear in the demo. Um, but by just writing this configuration, a service splitter for the service backend, and then defining my splits. Um, and as you can see, it's an array. So if I had more subsets, I could split between multiple of those as long as the weight counts up to 100, right? Um, so in this case, we only have two subsets, 50% to V1 and 50% to V2. So if we add this additional configuration, right? That's easy as writing that config. Now let's actually check in console first, right? We can see we got an additional block here, right? Where if we go to slash and it hits our, our splitter for backend, now we have a ratio of 50, 50 over those two subsets, right? Now that looks nice in the diagram. I might've just put a static image there. So let's double check that it actually works, right? All right, if we go to the normal URL, we are now getting hits from V2 and V1. And it's fairly random because obviously 50-50 and round robin. Um, but we're now splitting roughly 50-50 over those. If I still specify my header, I still always end up at the new version, right? So you could do um, a scenario where we have a header for a test group that then goes to the splitter and the test group gets split over A and B, for instance, right? You can do cool scenarios like, like that as well. Okay, now that this is all working really well, I'm, I'm pretty confident that the application works. So we can now just transfer all our traffic from V1 to V2. And all we have to do is write that configuration again. And then call the service, right? So without changing anything or deploying a, a new load, bal load balancer configuration, everything gets configured dynamically because the service mesh does all that routing and resolving for you. Um, so yeah, with that, that's kind of what I wanted to show you. Uh, we'll be packaging this up in a repository uh, so you can run this yourself, um, which has the, the nice benefit that you can do destroy and it'll actually get rid of everything. Um, so you don't have to worry about things still hanging around. See, everything is, uh, is broken. Um, so we'll, we'll share the link afterwards. Uh, back to you, Jono, I guess. Awesome. Thank you so much, Eric. So I, I do want to point out that, as we mentioned before, this is still very alpha uh, in terms of what has been released. But being able to see what is possible and it is part of what I personally enjoy working here at HashiCorp. I know for those who are on Windows workloads, this is a boon to hear about. Um, I have included our discuss forum here where we would love to hear about your feedback on any of the topics that we've talked about, share your excitement for the Windows support in Envoy, tell us how you're going to use it, what you want to see, especially in the Windows world. And for that, we, we are very excited to see how these conversations move forward. Just wanted to take a minute to see if there was any other questions, but it looks like there hasn't been. So with that, I will give everyone a moment. Uh, Eric, did you want to leave with any sort of closing closing thoughts on the Windows Envoy support? Um, I'm, I'm just super excited 
to see where, where this will go because this basically allows you to mix and match any OS and mash that all together, right? If you combine this with the mesh gateways, you could have HCS running, you could have a data center running Linux, you could have a data center running uh, Windows machines, and it would just feel like one big environment service-wise without any IP clashes or anything. It's, I'm just really excited. <laughs> and if anybody has any questions, feel free to reach out to us. We'd love to answer them. Any closing thoughts, Derek? Oh, I mean, I'm just excited as well. Um, you know, I've spent a lot of time in the Windows world in my career, and I'm, you know, it's just great to see the parity happening across the, the different platforms. Thanks for inviting me and letting me be part of the conversation with y'all. It's always a blast to hang out with you and uh, see what the DA team is up to. Awesome. Our pleasure. <laughs> So with that, just a couple quick reminders. So we have one more uh, Ignite Deep Dive next Tuesday. We also have our regularly scheduled Terraform community office hours. We'd love to see any of our viewers over there as well, too. Please feel free to reach out through any of the methods if you have any questions for what we have going on. Uh, we'd be more than happy to talk with you all. Thank you all so much for joining us and enjoy the rest of your week. Goodbye.